Improv is any type of theater that is fully unscripted and unrehearsed. Um, when a team comes to perform and do an improv show, um, they have no preconceived idea of what the show is going to be. They might get a suggestion from the audience or um, interview someone from the audience, and then everything from the show is based off that information they had no pre-knowledge of. Improv is different from stand-up. Um, a lot of times stand-up clubs are called the improv and that's confusing to people. Um, but for most improv, um, rather than one person up there with pre-written material, um, it's usually two people or a team of people that are improvising scenes like you might see in a sketch show or a play um, for an audience. A common misconception is that you have to be funny to do improv. Um, a lot of times people come into classes and they try to make jokes right away. Um, being funny definitely helps doing improv, but as long as you can act truthfully, you can probably do a good improv scene. A lot of people think because they might not think of themselves as, as fast thinkers or particularly clever that they can't do improv. But for the most part, if you're able to have a conversation with someone, um, you can think fast enough to do improv. Um, we improvise our lives, um, so as long as you can kind of get over the nerves of, oh, now I'm improvising within a character that might be a little bit different from myself, um, you're probably able to do improv. Technically, you only need one person to do improv. Um, as long as none of it is pre-written or pre-planned, it's improv. Um, most improv is with teams, either two people or really an infinite number, as big as the stage can, can fill. Um, but the majority of scenes are probably two to eight people. A term you're going to hear in any improv school you go to is yes and. And that means if I establish something in the scene as your scene partner, you have to say yes to it and build off of it. So if I establish, oh, we're police officers, you have to say yes and we're on a stakeout. Not always that literally, but something that builds off what I'm already giving you. The idea of who, what, where is, can you set up a world where we know what's the relationship between the improvisers, um, where is that scene taking place, and what are they doing together. Object work or environment work is any time on stage you see someone um, mime using an object that isn't there. Um, so they're doing the dishes, hopefully they're doing it in a way that makes it seem like they're actually doing that activity and interacting with the environment that they're making up. The simple definition of game is that it's what's funny about your scene. A more complicated definition is that it's a pattern of behavior that stems from a first unusual thing. Um, but game can be found anywhere. It can be found in improv, but it could also be found in a comedy show, a, a stand-up, or a sitcom, or a movie. It's any funny pattern that gets repeated. When you justify in an improv scene, you take an idea that is unusual or absurd and you add some sort of logic to it. If you're playing a character, you don't want to play a character that's just insane doing crazy thing after crazy thing. Hopefully when they do something that seems absurd, they have a logical point of view behind it. And as soon as you know that, then you can also hopefully figure out what would they do next. When people say resting the game, they usually mean resting what's funny or absurd in that scene. So that it's not absurd thing after absurd thing. You need to go back to what the world is, to what feels grounded, so that, that unusual thing stands out the next time you hit it. You don't necessarily need an MC or a host for an improv show. Most short form shows have MCs. Um, most long form shows that I know of don't. As long as you have someone who steps out and takes a suggestion, that's all you need. You can basically start improvising as soon as you can start talking, and most little kids improvise without calling it that. Um, anytime they're playing, they're improvising. Um, and then on the other end, a lot of people think, oh, I'm, I'm too old for improv. But you can improvise at any age, um, as long as you're willing to um, kind of let go of um, how, you're, how you look and, and hopefully be willing to be silly, then you can improvise. You can definitely be on an indie team and a house team. Um, a lot of times theaters don't want you to be on more than one team at their theater, um, partly to give as much performance opportunities as possible. Um, but for the most part, um, as, as long as it's okay with the, uh, the theater, then you can be.
An indie team, sort of like an indie band, is just one that is an independent um, entity that is sort of performing not with a label or with an, an improv at a house theater. They can perform at any theater that they want. Um, and a lot of students um, take advantage of being on indie teams to sort of hone their performance skills. A house team is something you audition for at any of the improv theaters. Um, and it's sort of owned by that theater, it's that theater's team, and you perform within it um, until they want you to move to another team. Um, you don't have as much ownership over a house team. One of the important ideas in improv is supporting your scene partner. And people ask, well, what, what does that mean? Um, the first thing is, if they establish something, try to say yes to it and build off it, which is yes and. Um, but really, it's anything that you think is going to help them, make them look good, um, is supporting your scene partner. The fundamental rule of improv, in my opinion, is to make your scene partner look good. That's one where, as long as you're following that rule, most other rules fall within that. Um, try not to deny, not asking questions, yes anding, all those are based on the idea of try to make your scene partner look good. A lot of people are concerned about whether or not it's okay to ask questions in scenes. Most improv teachers would tell you to try to limit your questions um, because anytime you ask a question you're sort of putting your partner on the spot to supply this information. But like any rule, it's sort of just a suggestion. It'll make your improv better and more consistent. Um, but if it feels natural and truthful to ask the question in that moment, it's okay to ask a question. A lot of good improv follows the same rules of good lying, which is if you and someone else are trying to lie, you better get your stories straight. Um, so if I say, um, we're in the library, and then you're like, no, we're not, we're at a basketball game, it starts to feel like a lie. Um, but if I say we're at the library and you say, yeah, we're both working on this um, Edgar Allan Poe paper, it starts to feel like the truth because we're building off it together. Um, if you deny something, you also slow down the progress of that scene. Um, you sort of say, well, I'm not interested in that idea, so we have to start over from scratch. You don't need costumes or sets or really anything to do improv. Um, you're going to be improvising all of it, so most of the time most teams only use chairs. You certainly could improvise with costumes and sets, but for the most part that kind of limits your imagination and where you can go in that scene. Um, when we end scenes in improv, we usually call that editing the scene, and there's a lot of different kind of ways to edit. Um, the most common is a sweep edit, where you see someone just run in front of that scene. Um, but there's transformational edits. Anything that transitions from one scene to, the, to another scene is an edit, and that can end the scene. When you initiate a scene, you're the person who's giving the first information to start that scene. Um, usually it's a line of dialogue, but you could technically initiate a scene with just a facial expression or just a little bit of object work. There's no set structure to improv in general. A lot of improv has a structure. A herald is a structure, that's one example. Um, but there's not a set one. Um, anytime you improvise, it could be different from the time you've improvised before. Creating environment in a scene is important. It's important for the audience to know where that scene is taking place and give it context. Um, the different ways you can do that, one is you can just do object work, or we even call it environment work, and that's anytime you, you mime something that's in that space to help us understand where you are. But also anytime you refer to the environment that you're in, um, you're helping set up that environment. People are sometimes concerned with um, places they shouldn't go in improv, boundaries. Uh, for the most part, it's common sense. You're just trying to do improv that's respectful of your partner and respectful of the audience. And as long as you're doing improv that you feel um, does that, then you don't have to worry about boundaries. So sketch, in a lot of ways, is almost the written form of improv. Um, there's a funny idea that gets explored, but in sketch it's written down and it's rehearsed, and in improv it's improvised. In an improv class, one of the things a teacher might do to help you in that scene is to side coach. And that means that while you're improvising, they might be giving you little suggestions um, or notes to sort of help you um, get the scene back on track or help you be aware of an idea that you have that seems funny and maybe you want to explore. A safe rehearsal environment for improv um, primarily is one that doesn't have judgments. It's one where you can make choices and feel free to fail 
and you know your teammates aren't going to, to judge you or, or make you feel stupid for that choice. Um, besides that, just the idea of being physically safe. Um, you never want to do something that's going to hurt yourself or anybody else in the scene. In improv, just like any kind of comedy, um, timing is really important. Um, there's no rule where the timing is going to be the same in every scene, um, so you really have to play it um, with sort of an ear for when does the absurd thing need to come back or when do I need to go back to what feels grounded. Um, but having a sense of timing and a sense of sort of rhythm in that scene is going to make the difference between a line that gets a big laugh and a line that for whatever reason doesn't. So people wonder with the definition of improv is everything is made up. Um, can any element of it be planned? Um, and for the most part, the only thing that might be planned in an improv scene is sort of the structure or the form. We might know that we're going to have a two-person scene to start this show. Um, but beyond what the structure is, hopefully you're not planning the content of the scene. Most of the time when a teacher is talking about the idea of going A to C, they're talking about it as far as getting away from what the suggestion was. So if a whole team is doing the suggestion of pizza, um, we don't have eight scenes where people are eating pizza. Um, a to C means A is pizza, that makes someone think of B, Italy, and they start a scene where a family is on vacation of Italy. Um, pizza might think of, make someone think of a diet, and they start a scene about someone who's trying to lose weight. And those are all ways you can A to C off the suggestion, so you do a, a lot of ideas, um, even though you're just coming from, from one suggestion. A big idea in improv is this idea of show, don't tell. Um, you always want to show what's funny, not talk about what's funny. So an active choice is anytime it's happening right now. Um, a passive choice is, what do you think about in the future we do this? Oh, do you remember in the past when we did this? And that's not going to be as satisfying as let's do that thing right now and show the audience. When you're improvising, you always want to continue to make discoveries, um, not get stuck on any one thing. Um, sometimes there could be a problem between two characters. You don't want that scene to be just discussing that first problem. If it's a game, you need to let go of the first problem so it can come back again a second time and be funny again. Um, but anytime you're doing a scene, you should continue to be um, discovering something new with your partner. When you start an improv scene, one of the first things you want to establish is the who, what, where. Um, the relationship between the characters, where those characters are, what they're doing. Um, but you hopefully don't want to do it in a way that feels clunky, where you start a scene by saying, you're my brother, we're at home, and we're playing Monopoly. Um, so as many choices you can make that are by the way you're behaving, um, it's like, hey bro, um, just by doing the object work of playing Monopoly, if you can establish those, cho those choices without just dictating those choices, that's going to look like a, a more natural way to start the scene. When people say to heighten the scene, what they usually are talking about is heightening whatever is absurd in that scene, um, the funny thing that is the game. Um, hopefully it starts in a way that is a little bit realistic, a little bit grounded, um, but as that scene goes forward, it can continue to heighten and be explored and become more absurd. How much you can exaggerate in a scene depends a little bit, uh, again, on the style of improv. If it's very realistic improv, you're probably going to want to exaggerate less. Uh, or at least make sure that you've really grounded it with a good justification. There's other styles that are a little bigger and a little sillier where they encourage you to play characters a little bit larger than life. To start an organic improv scene, you don't need any background information about the characters. Um, that's hopefully something you'll create with your scene partner. Um, sometimes people say a good improv scene is like the opposite of a Looney Tunes cartoon ending, where the sort of darkness swallows up the, the show. Um, in a good improv scene, the initiation is just a speck of what you can see of what that world is, and the other person yes ends it and it gets a little bit bigger. And then hopefully by the end of that scene, you know a lot about their background and who they are and what's going on, but you don't need that information going into it. One of the things that people get really in their heads with um, in improv is starting to learn the rules of improv um, and thinking that they should have those rules in their head all the time. But for the most part, those rules are just suggestions um, that if you try to do the things that those rules suggest, your scenes will feel more like real life and the scenes will be easier. But there's any rule you can think of for the most part can be broken and you can have a successful scene.